to recap what we're doing this week, we're reading chapter 10, writing for broadcast, which covers writing both radio and television. Um, so we're only going to be working on the radio part of it. Um, we are supporting this assignment, which is the radio feature assignment. We discussed it last class, but uh, again, I'd like to reiterate again and play a couple more examples of uh, professional uh, radio profiles or, or feature pieces so we get a sense of what we're trying to produce as you write a script based on your interview. Uh, and uh, again, the due date for this is October 2nd. Um, we're looking to write a two-minute radio feature script based on the interview that you conducted uh, for one of, one of the stories that you decided that you would report on, either a profile or an event. <clears throat> so we are charging ahead with this. Uh, there'll be in a second some demonstration of the format that we will use, which is exactly the same format that we used for the reader and rap radio scripts that you already turned in a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, given that you are writing this from your interview, what you would do, of course, is once you have your interview in combination with whatever background material you gathered before your interview to get a sense of either the life of the person you're talking about or the event that you were writing about, you'll be using that material as the information to write this story, most of which will be told in your words, right, as the reporter. Uh, so you'll be writing a lead, you know. Uh, uh, um, many people think that uh, organic is the way to go. But, uh, uh, you know, this farmer believes that uh, uh, organic farmers are not doing enough to bring pure produce to our table and then go in and, and start your story. So strong lead that you are writing for you to uh, say. Uh, we're looking for conversational tone. And you can say things like it's instead of it is, and she's instead of she is, so contractions are encouraged. You know, write this so that it's easy to say, as though you were speaking to a friend, uh, but uh, not, not slangy. Uh, rather just really clear for people to understand in a conversational way. Start off making your sentences short and you know structure them simply so that you're talking about a subject, doing something, having some kind of effect. You know, uh, The farmers pulled in early to get set up for the event. Um, active voice where appropriate. So uh, where you see that um, you know the event was put on by several farmers. You know, you could say rather several farmers put on the event. You know, and, and it's that much easier for people listening to your story to get it. Attribution before the actuality, but you're also allowed to put your attribution in uh, somewhere in the midst of an actuality as well. So when we have an actuality, that means we're actually using some of the words of the person that we interviewed, their exact words. So this would be the equivalent of a quote in a newspaper story. So usually in a newspaper, you can attribute the quote to uh, uh, a person after they say it. In radio, you typically want to tell us uh, before we hear a clip. So, you know, Joe Farmer uh, loves the early morning start. And then you start the actuality and say, uh, you know, sun's just coming up, or whatever. Uh, so you attribute the quote usually before we hear somebody's talking. But you can also have them interject something and then identify them. So you could have somebody, uh, you could, for instance, uh, sun's just coming up. And then you say, you, the reporter, 
you say something like, uh, um, farmers love early mornings. And then you continue on with the actuality. Uh, we usually pull in around 6 a.m. or something like that. So whatever they're saying, I'm just making all this up. But the point is that actuality, uh, the, the, the attribution um, typically uh, is going to come either before or early on in a split actuality. So that's, that's what we're all clear about, attribution, right? That's where you say who's talking. OK, good. And end with a lockout. So you know this is Cecil Cecil reporting for KCSF. You will do that. Okay. So typically, we don't put the questions that you asked into the script. Uh, you're just using whatever came out of the interview as actualities. Uh, you are required to write the reporter's words that set up each actuality. So that's called the write in. And we'll take a look at that in a second. So you know. You, what you need to do is to write into the, the actuality that's coming up to sort of set it up so we understand what's going to be said. Um, and we have sample scripts for examples. So that brings us to the format. Um, so here is where I have sample scripts and an example of the format for you. You've already um, dug into this. Here it is. You've already used this resource that I prepared for you when you were working on the radio reader and wrap. So by the time we get to the feature, here is an example of the feature. It's on page six of that linked PDF document. And as you can see, it has all of the same formatting characteristics as the reader and the wrap. One, two, three line slug at the start with the title, underemployed, the reporter's name, yours in this case. And the total runtime, in this case, it's two and a half minutes. Remember, you're required to do two minutes, so it's a little shorter. Uh, you start off with the anchor's introduction, which is setting up your story. And then you move into your reporting. Uh, and we use um, identifiers in uh, square quotes, square brackets in the story. So as you see down here, uh, we're seeing when you have an actuality, we put it in a square bracket with the name of who's talking. We can put nat sound. We use nat sound to describe sound effects that you may want to have appear in this. And you know, uh, we would want to also put the name of the reporter. In this case, it would be Adam. We'd want to put it here. So NPR didn't do it for whatever reason. This is an NPR script. But I would like to you to, you know, if it's Chow who's reporting, then Chow should put, put Chow here. 50-year-old Joel Leck has two college degrees, two decades experience in IT, etc. So this is what the reporter is saying. So when you go to an actuality, when you come back to the reporter, put your name in there again in square brackets. Notice it's all caps, which is what we did before, uh, except for the actualities, which are in sentence case. So when you see sentence case or when I see sentence case, it means this is somebody who is actually talking, right? Uh, and then put the total runtime to the actuality just afterwards. So if it takes four seconds to say, OK, total is 3408. Plastic OK, that takes four seconds, then just write that in after the actuality that you put there, OK? Uh, remember that you pay special attention to uh, your lead. And also remember, at the end, you should uh, have a lockout. So at the end of it, you are going to say, uh, and this is Chow Trong reporting for KCSF yes. right? as, your, as your lockout. So those are the main. Um, formatting requirements. Let's just see if there's anything else here. I should have, uh, did that open in a web browser? I guess so. so there we go. Format instructions were presented in class. And those of you who are watching us on TV, um, there you go. You got those instructions. And where I'm pulling all that from is the 
the linked PDF. Okay. Uh, if there are ever any, you know, words that you don't understand in my description, go back and just look uh, on the first couple of pages. There are, um, you know, like a glossary. Like, what's a lockout? Those are the final words of a report spoken by a journalist. That sound that defines that sound. the feature. So this talks more generally about the feature. And great advice here is read your draft out loud to find errors and rough spots to fix. So the last thing you want is to have someone reading your script on air and then to like run into some problem that you left there. And of course, uh, we're all going to meet up to read these back in class. So you know, you'll, you'll definitely detect all of your typos or any other mistakes. Um, if we get into class and, and you're reading it back, it's like, oops, typo. So eliminate it now, because that's what you would want to do uh, if you were writing professionally for a uh, broadcast. You're doing two minutes. Two minutes. OK, so I'm just checking chat to see uh, if there are any questions there so far. People seem to be following along from afar. So that's great. So uh, I want to play some uh, more audio examples of this type of radio reporting. Again, primarily to, well, to see how it's done, but also to emphasize that it's you, the reporter, who's driving this story with what you say. This is not a kind of uh, an assemblage of actualities that drives itself. Really, this type of story, um, you're, you're the one propelling it. So, we, we listened to Mike Sugarman and one from Holly Kwan. Let's hear another one from Holly Kwan. About teen suicide. That's a pretty... <laughs> Gun High is an idyllic campus. Its peaceful Oakfield grounds foster a buoyant spirit and academic brilliance. Each year, there are nearly 100 National Merit Scholars. But last year's frightening suicide cluster took hold of the community, forcing students, parents, and professionals to take a closer look at the often overscheduled pace of teenage lives. I was doing badminton. I was on cheer this year, and I was um, the junior uh, vice president, so I had to deal with homecoming. Just the pressures of everyday life can just build up inside you and explode at completely random intervals. Dr. Philip Ray is executive director of Palo Alto's Adolescent Counseling Services. He suggests high achieving students are acting based on what they see at school and at home. That's hard for, for any community to look at oneself and say, how are we behaving? What are we doing? And, and how is that translating into kids' behavior and so forth? Parents are putting a lot of pressures on themselves in terms of being successful and being the best at what they're doing. And that's translated into, you know, the, the kids' behavior. Experts caution stress does not directly lead to suicide, but it can exacerbate pre-existing mental issues that may have gone undetected. Eve Meyer is executive director of San Francisco Suicide Prevention. When a person has depression, and stress comes along and ratchets up the pain, then they are vulnerable, and then you want to worry about them. Palo Alto City and school officials have stopped talking publicly about the suicide cluster for fear of contagion, but this isn't unique to that city. Cornell University is reeling from three student suicides since February 17th. Last month, a 14-year-old Pleasanton freshman took her life on the Union Pacific tracks just before class let out at Amador Valley High. Kelly is an Amador senior. It's always awful, like knowing somebody felt like they're in so much pain that the only reason they could fix it is by taking their life. The train tracks run right between the school and Valley Community Church, where Reverend Jeff Lang is high school pastor. It doesn't just affect the individual's family. I mean, tremendously does, but it's greater impact on the community is felt also because this is one of our own who has made this decision and where have we been as a community we don't want this to happen again we'll take a closer look at what's stressing kids out in our next report Holly Kwan KCBS Gosh. Okay. what teenage boy doesn't want his own electric guitar <laughs> she's got a whole reel so what did you guys think of how that was covered It was pretty fast, yes. In fact, you know, uh, again, in broadcast, you got limited time, so you're trying to communicate things as effectively as possible. So it's true, it's pretty fast. Did you notice that uh, sometimes the write into the actuality is pretty simple? 
uh, you know, it is like Kelly is a senior at Amador High, and then Kelly sort of says what she has to say. So, you know, the link between the body of the story and um, uh, why we go to Kelly is established in the lines before, but I'm just pointing out how often this tendency to um, uh, attribute, to identify who's talking, comes up just before the actuality. Okay? So it's pretty much a rule, but again, uh, in your work, because you may have fewer sources, like there were five sources of actuality in this uh, short piece, um, which was great. We heard from experts, you know, who, uh, like, who might be interested in this story? Who might be instantly concerned by this story? Parents. Uh, parents, right? I mean, I'm listening to it. I'm freaking out. I'm saying, you know, is there too much pressure on my kids? I mean, are they, uh, you know, should we not just back off and let them, like, not submit their homework once in a while? But rather than put stress on them so much, you know, and definitely here in the Bay Area, it's like everyone's working like mad, so you know, it, it rubs off on kids. So for sure, yeah, that's we're definitely concerned, and so it's a real service to us to hear from you know uh, school board experts or you know I can't remember what Eve Meyer actually did, but if we played it back, we'd hear. So you know, it, it's doing a service for us to to hear from the experts, definitely. So. Uh, What else do we want to point out there? I'm not sure. I mean, again, to come back to the basic point, which I hope everyone's getting, is you know this is driven by the reporter. These short actualities are you know giving us vital information from experts or important people, but it's the reporter who's driving. So let's hear another one from uh, this is Doug Southern. Two minutes, same length as you guys will be writing. All aboard the Hyde Street cable car. This is a man's world. They call him the Gripman, the guy driving the eight-ton cable car. Muni has compared grip man training to Top Gun fighter pilot school because it takes coordination, upper body strength. And Willa Johnson's got it. She's broken through the glass grip, forcing Muni to change the job title to grip person. It took two tries, but Johnson was determined to succeed. Just because they say I couldn't do it. She's not the first woman at the grip. There was one once before, but she's the second and only now. Sometimes I sit back and look at them and I'd be like, wow, this is really something. This, this is a historic vehicle and it's, it's, it's really something. Johnson's got pink monogrammed leather grip covers and a certain rhythm working the foot brake and the long grip handles up and down Knob Hill. You have to know the, the feel of the car um, with the brake and the grip. California Street, Knob Hill, top of the Mark Fairmont Hotel, California Street. Two weeks at the helm, she's getting used to the tourist jokes about woman drivers. The men say that, and a lot of, a lot of the women be like, oh, we're probably more safe with her than anybody. So, you know, it's, it's funny to hear the things people say. Her regular riders, like Rose from Chinatown, say only nice things about Johnson. She's a real nice lady. And Australian tourist Fiona White is proud to ride with a pioneer. I think it's fantastic. And I think she's probably very strong because it looks like really hard work changing um, the tracks and managing the brakes and so on. How's the yeah. bell on this car? The bell on this car is good. Yeah, it is. It's a good bell. Good tone. Yeah. Johnson is slowly winning over the guys at the cable car barn, though she admits she's got some work to do if she's going to become Muni's first female champion, bell ringer. In San Francisco, Doug Sovereign, KCBS. I can't keep up. I can't keep up. But uh, let's, let's just hear it from the top again, because I think the opening of that was fun and well done. So let's head back to you. All aboard the Hyde Street cable car. This is a man's world. They call him the Gripman, the guy driving the eight-ton cable car. World. Muni has compared Grip Man training to Top Gun fighter pilot school because it takes coordination, upper body strength. And Willa Johnson's got it. She's broken through the glass grip, 
forcing Muni to change the job title to Grip Person. Okay, boy. Uh, I couldn't even get back to my little overhead there. Oh, that's all my fault. But uh, so, so, what did you think about the way they opened that one up? I like the music. You like the music? It's a man's world, right? Which, which obviously connects to the theme of the piece, which is we're you know looking at a a, a, a woman cable car operator, which is uh, somewhat remarkable, I guess. But it's uh, so that's a great framing device, and uh, so. Uh, the lead here is kind of like uh, all aboard, you know, it's, it's setting us right into the action, which is interesting. Then you got the Nat sound. I mean, should we call it Nat sound? I guess we do in our form of script writing. So there's the song, It's a Man's World, uh, which, you know, that's probably not the title. Anyone know the title of that song? Yeah. Maybe It's a Man's World. I don't know enough about music. Uh, and then, you know, uh, it's, it's very tightly scripted and nicely done. So consider starting your profile or event off with that type of... Or the Hyde Street cable car. This is a man's world. They call him the Gripman, the guy driving the eight-ton cable car. Muni has compared grip man training to Top Gun fighter pilot school because it takes coordination, upper body strength. And Willa Johnson's got it. She's broken through the glass. So it takes and then coordination, upper body strength, right? So that's a very nicely written right in, you know, that's what that's called. It's a right into the actuality. So that um, is clever, good writing, and it results in a piece which gives you a lot of images in your head about what's going on. And, uh, you know, it presents a, a theme for the show, sort of. Uh, about, you know, uh, Willa moving into a position which is often uh, done by men and the reactions that they get and her strength in making change within an organization like Muni, which I'm sure is not easy to pull off at all. Um, and, you know, and it's coming at us in a kind of an enter entertaining way. So think about, you know, the possibilities for you guys to do that um, with, uh, with your... Um, <clears throat> With your reporting, you know, Chow, I, I don't know if you discussed music with, uh, with your friend, but, you know, you could pick some appropriate music and, and slate that in there. Why not? You know, uh, all, of, all of these broadcast outlets can pull on that type of music if they want. So, um, so again, to come back to it, we are, you know, writing stories that are driven by the reporter. But you can be very inventive and clever about how you mix actuality in with natural sound and with what the reporter's doing. You know, obviously you want the ringing bell of the cable car at some point in there too, so you can script that in as natural sound and stuff. Um, so give a thought as to how you will uh, put audio into this as well as uh, you know the basics that we're talking. About. Right. So, just going to check out in chat. See if they, okay. So here we go. Uh, let's take a look at that handout that I gave you. So let's look at six B. And uh, again, for those uh, following along with us within the course modules, you can see this same handout. Wow, it's kind of huge. Um, can I shrink this down? Maybe I can shrink it down. There we go. I could also have put it under the <clears throat> under the microscope here. Okay. So this is an exercise in choosing effective sound bites. So put yourself in the shoes of the reporter who's gone to uh, talk to people after um, <clears throat> a meeting where they found out that commercial zoning would be 
allowed in their neighborhood. So again, this is, uh, you know, if the event that you set out to cover was, you know, a neighborhood governance type of meeting, um, you know, then um, this would be a real typical type of thing that you would follow up at the meeting by talking to a couple of people who attended the city council's meeting. Hopefully you find somebody who was actually impacted. Remember foci? So one of those is impact, right? And immediacy. Um, so you would come away with a short interview like this, and uh, you would be trying to pick sound bites out of it, just as you are in your own reporting. Um, and one piece of advice we could give here is, notice it doesn't go on for very long, this interview. And uh, um, you, you would actually be surprised at how brief and prompt a lot of professional broadcast interviews are. Why do you think they try to keep it so short? You don't need all this information? Yeah, the more you record, the more you have to deal with, you know? So if you roll tape for 40 minutes, it's kind of hard to sift through all that, especially when you got four or five stories you're in charge of uh, per day, which for a radio reporter is probably the case. TV, it might be less, like one story or maybe two. The radio items are short. So you don't roll too much tape um, and you come away with something here. So how long have you lived in the neighborhood? 30 years. Zhao, what do you think about that question? It's a close-ended question, absolutely. So you know, there's a couple of warm-ups here that are not going to lead to a lot of uh, uh, of uh, explanation. Are you upset with the council's move? Yes. Why? So now, obviously, um, the why and the how questions are great open-ending, you know, questions that will get people talking. So the response, uh, you see, uh, my family's grown up and, uh, well, the kids are gone now, but my wife and I have lived in this neighborhood for almost 30 years. And it's been a nice place. And I don't see why they think that we should have commercial zoning, parking meters, and then, you know, what's next? They'll be tearing down houses to put up stores. Look at these houses. People have put a lot of loving care into them. Families have grown up here. I don't know why we need more businesses in downtown Steeltown. Next question. I hear they're offering a lot of money for the homes. So my neighbors have been offered 20000 over the market price and even heard rumors but some have been offered 45,000 over the current price. These homes are in the $250,000 range right now. Question, won't that help? Well, that's what the business people of the city council think. Personally, they can take all that money and throw it in the river. This is my home. You notice they didn't vote to put businesses in their neighborhoods. It's just another case of the little guy getting shafted by the rich. You sound like you're ready to fight this. We're getting a lawyer. We're already identified a few laws and the council broke the, in this rezoning. We'll file appeals next Tuesday. We'll stall this in the courts. We'll take it to the Supreme Court if necessary. <laughs> wow, thank you. All right, cool. So <laughs> in sifting through this, um, you know, so what do you guys think? Our assignment here is to choose one to choose one weak bite. In other words, what would a bite be that you know probably would be better said by us rather than taking uh, the uh, taking it as an actuality? And then two uh, two bites are actualities that we would want to use. And, uh, so you know, there's not really too many right or wrong answers here. We we really just want to discuss. So what do you think? First of all, would be a, a weak bite. What what might be something that's better said by, by you? The first two. The first two? Yeah, the first two questions. Oh, yeah, because they're closed-ended questions? Yeah. You know, in, in a way, of course, you would probably want to say, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Kelly's been in the neighborhood 30 years, and he's hopping mad, right? And then you get into it. <laughs> so you've saved, you've saved a lot of time just that way. So good call, William. And now looking in the longer stretches here, I see three paragraphs or more. Which one do you think would be best said by you, the reporter, most efficiently communicated by you? So which is the weak bite in here? Um, I guess the top one. Hmm. OK. 
you could use descriptive language to articulate the, the setting better, whereas I feel um, the, the middle one uh, is the best like direct sound bite because um, of the uh, implications in it, I think would be difficult to put like journalistic integrity behind. So it's better to have your uh, your interviewee say something like, "I've even heard rumors of." I got it. Okay. All right. Others? Other ideas? Let's see what we got in chat before I jump in. Oh, I know what I have to do. Get out of full screen. Come into chat. See if folks are talking. <coughs> Desiree, thank you, Desiree, says, weak bite, how long he's lived there, for sure. We can explain that when we get into the juicy sound bite. Absolutely. So Desiree confers with William. Uh, nobody else has weighed in on chat. Uh, let me give you my opinion on this, which, again, there's no right or wrong answers here. But um, what I'm feeling is that the, the the interview is too confused as to what wants to say here. My neighbors have been offered 20,000 over the market price. I've even heard rumors that some have been offered 45,000 over the current price. These homes are in the $250,000 range. It's true we could use that, but it's a lot of numbers coming at you right away. 20, 45, 250 um, might be hard for them to process. Um, so. I, I might, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm calling that a weak bite. And I think I'd more likely go for what this guy is communicating what is most upsetting or the actually even the affect of being upset. So, uh, you know, there's nothing to stop you. And William has a good point is that, okay, we don't know how factual this is, but you could say something like, uh, Kelly says that these houses, which are, uh, you know, which are in the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar range, are getting offers, which is something, you know, sometimes even forty five thousand dollars over the current price. As long as you say Kelly says, you know, you attribute that fact to him. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, um, in in explaining actualities and attribution, we've paid a lot of attention just to make sure that people understand who's talking. But another reason for using attribution is if you want to distance yourself from the facts that you're putting forward. So you can, you know, by attributing this to Kelly, you can say, OK, yeah, so Kelly tells us this. So at that point, you know, I might do that if I feel I can, you know, disambiguate a little bit and just say, you know, as much as $45,000 over the $250,000, you know, or as much as $45,000 over the quarter million, uh, you know, value of the house. Probably do it that that way somehow, you know, and it's easier to speak it. You can round things off well. So maybe you believe me, maybe you don't. But let's let's assume that we've got um, a. Uh, <clears throat> how can we extract a strong bite from the first paragraph here? You see, uh, my family's grown up, and uh, well, the kids are gone now, but my wife and I have lived in this neighborhood for almost 30 years. It's been a nice place. And I don't see why they think that we should have commercial zoning, parking meters, and then, you know, what's next? They'll be tearing down houses to put up stores. Look at these houses. People have put a lot of loving care into them. Families have grown up here. I don't know why we need more business in downtown Steeltown. So what would you pull from that in terms of actuality? Actuality usually runs in broadcasting, 10 seconds minimum, 20 seconds maximum usually. So we could almost say a good chunk of that at 20 seconds. But what, what would you pull? And you feel free to underline and highlight on your on your scripts if you want. The last, I guess, three sentences are interesting to me. People have put a lot of loving care into them. Families have grown up here. I don't know why. Yeah, so you'd have to go with, look at these houses. Look at these houses. People have put a lot of loving care into them. Families have grown up here. Right. I don't know why we need more business in downtown. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that, William. What do you guys think? You know, And that might be something that you could even move towards the end of the story, because it has a kind of summary, summary vibe to it. Yeah. You know? 
Other ideas, Chow or, or Ron or anybody online? Start from look at these houses. Okay, so Ramon has the same idea. I think so. Uh, okay, Katerina, okay. So anyhow, R Ramon uh, confers with William. So I think you guys are all onto that. Get that sentimental value. I, yeah, yeah, I agree, Ramon. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, we're using actuality to get a feeling for the people who are really involved. You know, we, we can give those facts and we can say, you know, uh, um, you know, about the market value of the house and stuff. But to hear someone who's upset about this, I, I think that's, that's important. Um, you can go too far and, you know, the news becomes just people crying. But uh, I, I think, you know, the nature of actuality is, is that um, we, want, we want, if not just sentimentality, but a sense of who these people are, and the stakes and stuff. Okay, uh, so again, uh, you may be able to play this bite, but I'm saying that's probably the weak bite. Um, then can we, can we come up with something from the last two questions? So we're dealing with, won't that help? Uh, well, that's what the business people of the city council think. Personally, they can take all that money and throw it in the river. This is my home. You notice they didn't vote to put businesses in their neighborhoods. It's just another case of the little guy getting shafted by the rich. All right, and then the next one, you sound like you're ready to fight this. We're getting a lawyer. We've already identified a few laws. Uh, the council is rezoning. We'll file appeals next Tuesday. We'll stall this in the court. We'll take it to the Supreme Court. So I believe that this is what Ekaterina is saying, that we can probably have the reporter give these next steps in the kind of end of the story statement, which I think makes a lot of sense to me. So let's say we're picking from here. What would make, I mean, what do you, why would this be a strong actuality, do you think, apart from, you know, the guy, the little guy getting shafted by the rich, which is quite a charged. Okay, so when he said, you notice they didn't, I didn't put the businesses in their, their own neighborhoods. Yeah, oh, absolutely right. And that, and that, it, it stood out to me because that's awfully suspicious, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. So I think that, we'll see you, William. I think that what you're getting at is, and I would, I would have gone there too, is that, this bite has the conflict in it. You know, it has, it has this idea that it's the business people on the city council versus the homeowners, you know, the people who actually live there. So I think that makes that an important actuality. You know, remember we talked about foci. Again, the C in foci stands for conflict. And uh, so we already know that Kelly is super mad. But we're also here, he's, he's, you know, encapsulated the conflict for us, which is the business people of the city council versus the homeowners. And, uh, you know, that, that, is, that makes it a very strong bite, in my opinion. And, and Ron, I'm glad you brought it up and focused on that. Because, uh, you know, we want to develop on the conflict, and clearly it's there, and he's said it. So that's good. The more we can stand back and have other people confirm or present the important uh, aspects of the story, I think, is a good thing. You know, um, I have uh, probably have lost the example, but I have a very good example of a, um, a, a television news story about you know like peanut butter in schools and stuff, and. Uh, um, the flaw of the story, the reason I wanted to show it to people, is that the reporter found a lot of people who were saying it was really good to sort of ban peanuts from the school, or, uh, but they couldn't get anybody to say that it was bad. <laughs> and yet they knew that there was a bunch of people who were not happy with it. But the reporter basically had to bring up, you know, you, know, you, you, have, you have three bites of people who say, oh, this is really good, it's going to help kids. And then, and then the reporter has to say, but some people think that it's not a good thing. But they couldn't actually get anybody to say that. So it made the story kind of weak. OK, uh, but I think, pat ourselves on the back, I think we did a pretty good job of, of extracting 
two strong actualities. You know, the one that uh, introduced the conflict between the business people and the homeowners, and you know, the other uh, which exposed the depth of feeling that residents have uh, regarding this. And uh, we decided, I think, with pretty good logic and reason, that um, you know, the information about the market value of the houses and the, uh, you know, the amounts being offered would be better said by the reporter. And then the next steps in this story are you know, very often what you want to end your report with. It's like you know, the next thing is going to happen. So you'd be saying, you know, Kelly plans to fight it. They already have hired a lawyer. And uh, you know, they will uh, make an appeal at the next city council meeting next Tuesday. This is you know, typically what you want to end off with so that people will know what's the next news that's coming about this story. So I would reserve that information for the reporter. But uh, so good job, guys. Let's, let's try another one. Um, story 6C. And uh, let's see how well we can do with that. Let me just see if there's, again, any other comment from uh, uh, chat before we move on, because uh, these are good. Oh, no. Stream's gone down a little bit. Back on. Great. Um, so uh, if you, you might have missed, we uh, folks, we have moved on to exercise 6C here. It's the same game. Uh, we are trying to identify a weak bite, in other words, a bite that we would probably want to have the reporter, you know, summarize that information and introduce it. And we're looking for two strong bites. Be prepared to defend your selections. This interview is with Congresswoman Linda Bellwether, a three-time representative who is currently in a close election race that has featured mudslinging and serious negative advertising. So we're doing that. Um, thank you for doing this interview. You're more than welcome. Is the race tight? The polls right now show that I'm ahead 54% to 46%. I'm sure I'm leading because of my votes supporting gun control and federal money for schools. The pro-gun forces are campaigning very hard against me, and I'm misrepresenting my, and, and, and misrepresenting my stand on guns and for a citizen's right to own hunting weapons, but very strongly support strict registration of paramilitary weapons and battlefield gear. Huh. Question, what have they said? They say I favored taking guns away from citizens, and my vote wasn't anything about that. Still, you voted in favor of tighter gun registration laws at gun shows. Yes, I did, and I would do it again. My friends who are peace officers asked me to stop hasty sales at the show. It seems our first responders constantly deal with powerful weapons traded at these shows. I believe in supporting the good judgment of the cops and sheriff's deputy in my district, no matter what other organizations have to say. Your opponent has also questioned your attendance at congressional sessions. My opponent doesn't know what he's talking about. When you are at work in Washington, DC, you have many committee meetings and many other commitments, including meetings with constituents every day. Often that means you can't attend to every general session of Congress, but then no one does. My opponent is very naive, and if he knew anything about what goes on in Washington, he wouldn't make such outlandish charges. Question, some have said that you were running a negative campaign. How do you respond to that? I didn't start with negative ads, and I didn't run them until my opponent launched a series of lies and half-truths about my record. Honestly, he just doesn't know anything about Washington politics and how it works, and he has no record of any public service to demonstrate his experience. All right. So I'm looking at this. And I, you know, I almost feel like all the other the other interview yielded a lot. In this, I, I feel there's a lot that I would want to avoid putting up there. There's a lot that I. It's kind of Trumpish. It's kind of Trumpish. Yeah, yeah. Chow, what are you thinking? I was thinking the same thing. Same thing. Ron, go on. And it's like, it's like uh, this guy, this guy, and this one, and he doesn't understand how to read this, and I'm a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly what I would want to avoid, too. You know, there's a certain amount of finger pointing and ad hominem, which means, you know, kind of very personal criticism in there. And if, if you just run with that, if you make your bites that, 
uh, you're kind of you're becoming the mouthpiece of you know uh, of one pr particular political candidate, and so with them talking like that, it kind of disqualifies a lot of that uh, stuff. So I'm uh, you know already I'm looking through it, and I'm thinking, woo, you know I can't use this stuff when you know she says honestly he just doesn't know anything about Washington politics and how it works. Uh, those kinds of things I want to avoid. Uh, because I, I don't have anything that I can, uh, you know, uh, supply as balance, and it's really kind of very, very personalized mudslinging. So uh, let's take it from the top and see what we could use. Uh, another, another thing I'm concerned about is uh, the kind of automatic, call it boilerplate, or, you know, the the stuff which this candidate has said a thousand times, which everyone has heard, and so therefore isn't really news to us. So that's another thing. You know, I'm for a citizen's right to own hunting weapons, but very strongly support strict registration of paramilitary weapons and battlefield gear. Said it so many times, you know. Um, so, do you see anything up there, G given that we're trying to avoid both those things? Do you see anything there that we can use that you would think of using? Tough, huh? But I, I do believe that there's a strong bite in what's on the screen current. Ideas? Let's see if anyone in chat. Well, I'm not sure if they're getting the stream. I'm hoping they're going to participate as well. That was really fun to hear from them, too. Um, I should, I'll really, from here on in, I'll have a second screen open for chat. Well, let me, let me, let me propose this to you and see what you guys think. I think this would be a good bite. My friends who are peace officers asked me to stop hasty sales at the show. It seems like our first responders constantly deal with powerful weapons traded at these shows. That would be, that would be a bite that I would propose to you. Yes. What, what do you think of it? Yeah. Ron, why do you think it sounds interesting? Well, they said friends uh, who are peace officers, and they said that, um, they said earlier there are four hunting weapons, but not militarized weapons, it's kind of conflicting. Yeah, 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 I... It's like, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're for, if you're pro for hunting weapons, why are you friends with peace officers in the first place? Ah, interesting, okay. But that's just me. Yeah, I mean, what I was thinking about here when I, when I looked at it uh, is, um, you know, there's a certain kind of immediacy in talking about, uh, you know, the, the officers in that way, in the sense that, you know, this just sounds to me more, uh, more reasoned and less kind of reflexive. This is, this is a politician who is in, in touch with some kind of constituency, you know? And, uh, you know, depending on how you feel about the police and what they do, which is a mixed bag right now, but uh, my friends who are peace officers asked me to stop hasty sales at the show. It's less about I'm for this, I'm for that. It's more about I serve this constituency and they have this pretty reasonable claim which, or, or request, which is that we stop selling dangerous guns at these shows. So I, I, would, I would go for that because it has a kind of an immediacy to it and it has you know, an angle which is you know, less about I stand for this, and I do this and that, and it's all very abstract. I don't know. Do, do, what do you guys think of that? So my bite is, my friends who are peace officers asked me to stop hasty sales at this show. It seems our first responders constantly deal with powerful weapons traded at these shows. Maybe? I don't know. Okay. That is a lot better. It's, it, it is something, right? I, we don't have... And then, you know, we don't have a, a ton of riches here that we got to deal with because there's so much either, you know, photocopied campaign speech or, or uh, you know, uh, a lot of negative stuff. Let's see, can we, can we find anything in the second section? You mean one uh, with a question about the congressional sessions? Yeah. Yeah, Chow says it sounds like a lot of trash talk and, and justification. Yeah. 
you know, I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost the first, I can't run, my opponent doesn't know what he's talking about. I can't run, my opponent is very naive, and if he knew anything about what goes on in Washington, he wouldn't make such outlandish charges. So out of here, there's the potential for, when you're at work in Washington, D.C., you have many committee meetings and many other commitments, including meetings with constituents every day. Often that means you can't attend every general session of Congress, but then no one does. I don't know, it all sounds pretty bad to me. <laughs> yeah. Many committee meetings and many other commitments, including meetings, you know, that just sounds like, the, like it sounds like you're saying, you know, kind of like justifying yourself, you know. So I don't know, maybe there's nothing there. Uh, and how about this? I didn't start with negative ads and I didn't run them until my opponent launched a series of lies and half-truths about my record. Honestly, he just doesn't know anything about Washington politics and how it works. It's, yeah, not great. Well, maybe some folks in chat have some ideas for us that um, something that could be used in there. Not sure. Desiree, thank you, Desiree. I prefer her quote about the first responders asking for this type of gun laws. It's more about her decision-making skills and why she votes this way. Awesome, yes. Shows more about her as a politician, I agree. And who she listens to and how she makes decisions rather than responding to, yeah. I, I think, so I think we did find the one, the one bite that, that makes sense there, and Desiree has something. I see Ramon is typing something for us. So hopefully he's got some insight what, what could be done with those last two paragraphs, if anything, it's possible. Um, <clears throat> you know, we just walk away and say, well, at least we got something out of that. Yeah. The quote about first responders would be good because it is an example of the people she's trying to protect. Again, so we all, we all pretty much agree on that, which is great. And I, I don't feel like it's, you know, uh, being kind of politically biased towards her. Uh, which I would, I, I would feel if we were, you know, just putting the mud slinging out there. I, you know, again, I feel like it's, it's her serving her constituency with, and very reasonable responses. So, okay, so, well, let's look back up to the beginning of the story again, just to see if, is there something else we could pull there? So the polls right now show that I'm ahead, 54% to 46%. I'm sure I'm leading because of my vote supporting gun control and federal money for schools. The pro-gun forces are campaigning very hard against me and misrepresenting my stand on guns. I'm for a citizen's right to own hunting weapons, but very strongly support strict registration. Oh, I'm real sure. Uh, my God, good thing she can say it. I can't. <laughs> uh, so is there anything in there? As soon as I see those numbers, I think that's probably something better off for me to say, especially since she uh, jumps in and says, I'm sure I'm leading because of, so she's making her own interpretation of these numbers, um, which would be a typical kind of politician's pivot. You know, they, they like to, um, you know, constantly pivot to something that, you know, their talking point, their thing. I would, I would, you know, I would think I would probably take control of that and, you know, say uh, she's leading right now. Uh, she's got a very narrow lead at, at the moment, 54% uh, to 46% of her opponent. And, you know, the campaign is getting down and dirty or negative or something like that. And then I might try to exploit at least her side of this, and she says, I didn't start with negative ads and didn't run them until my opponent launched a series of lies and half-truths about my record. The problem there is I don't have anything to, to balance that back. So I take it back. I wouldn't go with that. <laughs> I could at least report where they stand. I'm stumped. Unless anyone has more, I just say we go with the one sound bite. So let's just, uh, um, I, think, I think that would, good work there. Let's say we focused on my friends who are peace officers asked me to stop hasty sales at the show. Uh, well, you know, let's get out of this one and let's go back to the first one. And we identified, okay, I think we, we identified that's what the business people of the city council think. Personally, they can take all that money and throw it in the river. 
what I want to bring your attention here too is the uh, the way that you can trim an actuality to you know first of all remove things like well or uh um that type of thing so um, once you've identified your actuality and you have good reason for why you want to use it you know take a look at it and see how much can you chop it down in order to just come away with the essence of what you want. So easy example here, you're throwing away well. Uh, but sometimes you can also find you know, ways to cut it down. So let's say we throw away well. We've got, that's what the business people of the city council think. Personally, they can take all that money and throw it in the river. This is my home. Uh, so I'd stop there for sure. I mean, it kind of gives us a natural stopping point. These all, these all condense down pretty, pretty easily. Well, once you get the actuality, for instance, that's what the business people of the city council think. Personally, they can take all that money and throw it in the river. This is my home. Um, so what you're trying to do there, as you've isolated those actualities, is to uh, write what's called the write in. So write in, which is just basically how you will follow on with the actuality. So, you know, in, in some of the examples that we played uh, last class and this class, uh, you can see how skillfully they uh, write into the uh, actuality or even out of it so that they can condense um, what's being said. Let me just go back to one of the best examples of that, which we played last class, where we had like a kind of a series of, uh, uh, was it this one? Let's just see, the Muni ticket. Good evening, and this time I'm expecting fast, fast transfer. Not again. Good evening, folks. Fast, fast transfer ticket. This is the here. second time I've been caught without proof. I paid on Muni. I'm going to have to issue a citation, but you're going to have to get off of No! Track. Here's my story. You tell me if I deserved it. I'm rushing to get underground to catch my train. One pop, in three minutes. And I've got my two dollar bills, but Muni doesn't take dollar bills, and the machine that normally gives me change is... Stop this one. It's the, it's the fire story, that's the one that was... Like there were trains running underneath it or something. And as I came out the front door, there was stuff falling from the sky, and it, you could hear it falling almost like rain. It was debris from the exploding gas line 100 yards away, which sent a searing flame overhead. We didn't have to look back, we just had to look up, and it was above us. I didn't think we were going to be able to outrun it. Mary, being a faster runner, got away, but Chris and... Do so... Uh, out of the first bite where she says, I saw stuff falling out of the sky, Holly Kwan comes in right away afterwards and says, it was, you know, burning material, you know, that was coming down. So, you know, you could imagine that the actuality continued, uh, you know, along and along. But what she's able to do is kind of interrupt it at the end and finish off the idea and then pivot to the next, you know, action in the story, which is that they're running out of the house. So uh, uh, no great insight here except to say pay, pay attention to the right in and the right out from the actuality. You can often really just shorten it by taking a part of the action and then supplying the rest of it yourself, which is what she just did there. You know, instead of playing a long, long actuality, you can pick just part of an action and then write in the rest of it. Dr. Colleen found their knees buckling as they stumbled to safety. I kept rubbing my hair the whole time we were running because my head was so hot I thought my hair must be on fire. And I thought we were going to just naturally combust from the heat. By the time all three had escaped, Chris found the twins suffering second and third degree burns to their arms. Just, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then Colleen was saying, I'm burned, I hurt. And then we remembered that our cats were in the house, and that I just... I saying that the whole time. I know. And I thought, I've got to get these girls out of here. And so I, I felt like I had to say something, like, shocking. So I said, they're dead. The house is gone. We got to go. They got a ride to a friend's home where Chris... So we're using longer bites there because I think, you know, the material is so powerful to hear what happened and to hear their voices tell us what happened. 
but at least one example in there uh, of what I'm trying to talk about, which is if you have a long actuality, again, you can just play part of it as long as you can paraphrase and finish the rest of it off in your words. Uh, you can, you know, sort of pick and choose the, the, the parts that you want. Uh, so if we were to try something like that, uh, based on what we're seeing here, you know, uh, I don't see why they think that we should have commercial zoning, parking meters, and, you know, and then, you know, what's next? Then you can cut into that at a certain time. I don't know why, I don't see why they think that we should have commercial zoning, parking meters, and Kelly goes, you know, and, and, and Kelly feels that, uh, that, we sh that they don't need more businesses in setting up in Steeltown uh, where he grew up, you know. So you can play a part of what he's saying without playing the whole bite, and you can, uh, you know, um, you can then pivot to other information. So again, writing this up, I'm not that good at doing it on the fly, but you know what we could do is take part of that bite that we identified, uh, paraphrase through to then giving, you know, the prices of the houses. You know, again, as we said, uh, uh, you know, uh, developers are offering up to $45,000 over the quarter million valuation of the houses as they stand right now. But uh, Kelly is having nothing of it. And then you go to his next bite, you know. And so uh, the idea is to, uh, uh, to, to write in or write out of a sound bite in an effective way and then pivot onto the next thing that you need to say in the story. That's basically. So uh, um, give it a shot. And uh, hopefully, if you haven't got your interview now, in, in the very near future, it's going to happen. How did it go, Ron, just by the way? Is, did, you, did you get something to work with? No, not yet. It's not to go uh, interview. George? Oh, fantastic. I'm so glad that you're going to talk to him, because you'll get some great stuff, I'm sure. Yeah, OK. So, uh, so all of this will be more useful to you as soon as you've got, you know, your tape. And again, we've been working off of, let's say, full transcripts. You don't have to transcribe everything that you said, but rather give a thought, you know, to where your story is going and then run through the tape and just listening to it, try to, you know, find areas where it seems like things are stated, you know, Clearly, emotionally, uh, uh, but without you know slagging on somebody or you know, just you, you want to avoid putting out the most charged stuff, I guess. Although neither of you have stories that are particularly conflictual like that. So what I'm saying is you don't have to write it all out like this before you go choosing sound bites. You're going to listen to the tape that you got or to the recording on your phone or whatever and run through it and say, OK, what, what did I feel was you know, the, the stuff that gave me George's personality as, as clearly as I could get in a couple of, you know. He really cares about his students. Maybe there's you know, a 10 or 20 seconds uh, sound bite in there where you know, he talks about that. I'm not sure. Uh, but, but you'll get interesting stuff. OK, well, thanks for hanging in there and participating so much. You know? I mean, only a couple of people actually physically attending class today, so I appreciate you guys weighing in and doing so much on these different examples. And thank you to the folks uh, who were here in chat. Uh, oh, Eric has weighed in as well. Uh, OK, he's talking about the politician. Uh, OK, well, good ideas from Ramon and Eric. Um, uh, I'll continue on checking in chat next next class, and uh, and I'll try to have a second screen so I can see stuff coming in a little better. Thanks, guys. So so good luck getting those interviews and and uh, and just sorting through those actualities. Okay, it's not actually that long to write a couple of minutes as well. Once you get going, I don't know, but um, so so hopefully this weekend you can knock it out of the park. <laughs>